And so I think a lot of times people think, you know, there's a lot of people that teach out there that if you, if you eat fish on Fridays, and then you're going to go to heaven. You can live like a devil, but you got to eat fish on Fridays, you're going to go to heaven. Like God can care less what your diet is. What God cares about is where your heart is. But God does talk about fasting quite a bit. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. But uh, let's ask the Lord to be with us now, and let the Spirit be with us, and, and open our hearts. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would take over this time, that you open our ears, open our hearts to the Word of God, and that as the Word goes forward, I know it will accomplish that which you sent it to accomplish. I thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah, we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah wrote this during a time when God's people sought out empty forms of religion. And that's what people do today. A lot of people are looking for something. We would rather sacrifice a meal or a hamburger for a fish than we would to obey. And the Bible tells us to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey God is what He wants. And so He's not impressed with our, our Lenten fasts, giving up chocolate for the season of Lent, giving up you know, root beer, I'm no Pepsi for Lent, God could not care less. How about no sin for Lent? How about no adultery? How about no fornication? How about no pornography? How about no cowardice? How about no things that really God would want you to be involved with? That's what God wants is a, is a heart that's right. So we want to talk today, and I'm going to start in Isaiah chapter 58. And Isaiah is in the Old Testament. This is a messianic book. Isaiah really spoke tremendously about the birth of our Savior. And I'm just going to read the first five verses. Uh, and so we'll just let the Lord speak to us. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my name as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have they fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you have taken no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and I exploit all your labors. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. I want to find this in just, for some of you here, I want to find this just in a different translation, something maybe a little easier to, to swallow. This is the New Living Translation. Shout with the voice of the trumpet blast. Shout out loud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day. They seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation. Yet they would never abandon the laws. That they would never abandon the, the laws of their God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been so very hard on ourselves, and you don't even take notice. I tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourself. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anything for me. You humble yourselves by going to, through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? So there are a lot of people that quote, quote, fast, and we put these things down, and we think that, this is going to impress God. Remember something. God knows your heart. God knows your motives. He knows everything about you. You can't force God's hand and you can't smoke Him. You cannot fool God. So what we do, He knows why you do it. Now if you're fasting, we're going to see in the next part of this why we fast. So we need to guard against forms of godliness that have no power. We need to guard against forms of religiousness that have nothing to do with relationship with God. God wants a relationship with you, man. God wants a relationship with you, man. 
this is what he wants. He's not looking to. He's not up to. You know, I think some people think God's up there with a giant fly squad. Just wait. Oh, you mess up on my history. No. He's up there with his arms open wide, saying, I love you, and I want you to know me more. The more you know the Lord, the more you're going to love him. Godliness begins when a heart is turned towards God, with a life seeking to be molded into the image of Christ. Is that your goal in life? Don't answer me. But you know, what is your goal in life? Is your goal in life to be like Jesus? Is your goal in life to let Jesus Christ live his life in you? That's, these, that's what fasting is. It's fasting for me. Fasting for my own flesh. Fast, fasting for my own stupid self. And saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. That's what we need to fast from. You need to fast from you. And I need to fast from me. Because the more I die to myself, the more Jesus is going to live in me. And that's a good fast. That fast, God, God would honor that. So, we want to seek Him. We want to be molded into the image of Christ. We want to respond to the conviction of sin and the growing in love with the Lord. This is, what, this is why we're here, guys. We're not just down here. I'm not, I'm not down here passing out get out of hell free cards. Because there ain't any. I'm down here to tell you that, that you're sinners. We're all sinners. And that if you don't have Jesus, you are going to go to hell. When you die, if you die without Jesus, you don't have eternity without Jesus. You'll be lost without Jesus forever. That's why I'm here to tell you. But I'm here to tell you the good news is God has made a way for you and I. And we don't have to go to hell. Does that mean we're perfect? No, it means we're forgiven. But you know, sometimes I see this shirt, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. Well, some people use that shirt as an opportunity to, to sin. So I can wear this shirt and I can go sleep around or I can go, you know, kill my body with drugs and alcohol and do these terrible things and steal from people. But I'm forgiven. Are you really? Are you really? Repentance means you change directions. You go, you stop and you go the other direction. So let's go on a little bit further into this scripture from verses 6 to 14. Who's got a cough drop for that little sweetheart? That's what I do. I feel cough drop. You got one good. All right. I'm going to look at both of them again. Verse 6, Isaiah 58. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover them, and do not hide yourself from their flesh? And when the light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness go forth before you. The glory of the Lord God shall be your rear guard. They shall call, and then you shall call on the Lord, and he will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of your finger, and the spreading wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. He will strengthen your bones, and you shall be like watered garden. And like a spring of water whose water does not fail. Those from among you shall build their old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the reaper or the repairer of the breach. The restorer of the streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the, fat, from the Sabbath. From doing your pleasure on my holy day. Uh, and call the Sabbath a delight. A holy day of the Lord honorable. And we shall honor him, and do not your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now I want to just read this again in this translation. No, this is the kind of fast I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will heal quickly. 
Your goodness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you shall call. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, Yes, here I am. You will come quickly. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those who are in trouble. Then your light will shine out in the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as the noon. The Lord will continue to guide you and give you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the desert ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as the rebuilder of the walls and the restorer of the homes. Keep the day, the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interest on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath. And speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath and everything that you do on that day. And don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight, and I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. <coughs> so today is St. Patrick's Day. Now, I have two things to tell you. Now, I was raised Catholic. I have no problems with, you know, the Catholic. You understand? Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Ruby. You're my hero. That's not for me, though, for her. <laughs> Did you know that St. Patrick was a Catholic? It's true. St. Patrick was not Catholic. St. Patrick was absolutely, he was, he was stolen from the Druids. He was a prisoner and he was kidnapped for a long time. Anybody need one? Just shout right an inch from here. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he leaves. You don't think I can? Well, I can't. <laughs> This guy is kidnapped, and then when he's, he's away, he's kidnapped. Then he finally gets away, and God told him, go back and save those people, the people in Ireland. And he did, I mean, he started a revival that went on for a hundred years. And this is a holy man of God. Now, about all this business I've known about charming snakes and all some of the things I hear about, but he, would, he won souls to Christ. He won that continent. He won. Patrick was a man of God. And how do we celebrate his life? By going out and getting drunk. <laughs> Drinking cold, you know, green beer and, and puking all night. I remember when I was in the world, man, I couldn't wait to get drunk on St. Patrick's Day. Really, I had no idea who St. Patrick was. It's religiousness that doesn't call him God. So, what fasting is, is setting aside the time to fast and pray. And I believe you fast. Jesus was told, he, he said, hey, the disciples of John... You know, they fast, and these others fast, but your, your disciples don't fast. Jesus said, when the bridegroom was with you, you don't need to fast. But when he's gone, you don't need to fast. Well, he's gone, guys. He's gone back up in heaven. We need to fast and pray. To break the yokes of bondage is what he says here. Why do we fast? To break the yoke of wickedness, to unloose the heavy burdens, to let the press go free, and to break yokes, heavy yokes. There's another reason. It's to feed the poor. Take time that you would normally take to eat, instead of having lunch, Sometime this week, you don't have lunch. Open your Bible and let the Word of God be your lunch. You can do it lunch and breakfast. You can do it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, sometimes, you know, I fasted for many days in a row before when the Lord puts it on my heart to do so. That's between you and God. But sometimes, when I just can't get a breakthrough for something. The Lord wants me to fast and get, get through it. You know, there's those seven levels of intensity of prayer. Most of us only know about ask. The Bible says, asking shall be given. Seeking you'll find. Knock on the doors of heaven. That's what he said, right? And then if there's no miracle, you ask and there's no miracle. You seek, there's no miracle. There's no miracle. You knock on the doors of heaven, there's no miracle. Then you fast your prayer. And then if you still haven't got an answer, you still haven't got an answer with the Lord, then you... Vow your prayer. Like Hannah did. Lord, if you give me a son, if you give me a child, I will raise him and touch his hand. I will dedicate him to you. And if there's still no miracle, you weep your prayer. And then if there's still a miracle, you wrestle with God. So fasting is one of the seven steps and seven levels of intensity. Fasting is important. If you need a breakthrough in your life and you don't know what's holding you up, sometimes you just gotta you gotta turn the plate down a little bit. What you find is that when you fast, when your body becomes weaker because of lack of food, your spirit becomes exceptionally sharp. 
If you've ever fasted, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never fasted, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you've ever fasted for a number of days, you'll sense your spirit is very keen to the Holy Spirit. That's why we fast. So you can hear and get all the garbage out of your ears and get all this worldliness and all the things that we have over here out of our sight. You know, I can preach on the radio in Africa and we see all these miracles and, and people coming to Jesus. But over there, they don't have all the things we have over here. What we have over here are called distractions. We call them civilization. I think God might call it distractions. There was a man of God one time came from a very, very poor na a nation. And he came to a very affluent church in America. And when he brought him up to introduce him to the congregation, because they supported this man's congregation or his ministry, their wealthy pastor, and the pastor was wealthy, but he was himself. He said, we want you to know, Pastor, that we're praying for you in your poverty. And this, this man of God said, no, sir, you don't understand. We're praying for you and your prosperity. This prosperity message. You know, well, if, you, if you do for God, he's going to give you a jet. No, he ain't going to give you a jet. What would you do with a jet? You'd be driving a Mercedes Benz. Why? Why? How is God glorified because you drive a Mercedes Benz? How about if you take the money he blesses you with and you feed somebody who's hungry? Or you give somebody something to drink when they're thirsty and you give them some clothes. That's, that's the gospel. All this monkey shine that we got going on over here that we call God, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. That's exactly what he's talking about. That's what Carl was talking about. Out there in this corporate church. That doesn't honor God. That doesn't honor God. Then suddenly the pastor becomes the God. The leadership becomes the apostles. And, and suddenly the, the flock is not being fed. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Because he goes on and speaks about this. So let's, uh, he said, we fast. He said that, is it not to share? Why do we fast? Why not me not eating? Maybe I'll buy somebody else some food. Is it not to, to feed those that are hungry, he said. Is it not to, to help the poor? To bring the naked and cover them. That's why we fast. So we can get our own selves, our nasty old selves need to die. We are too wrapped up in ourselves. We have too much flesh. Way too much flesh. It's all about me. My. We've got to stop that. In the church we've got guys. We're going to come. Listen, we've got people here in our state that have lost everything. Everything. Family photos. <coughs> All the flat screen TVs are underwater. Tractors, we heard about a guy down, I've got some family down in Monroe, and uh, there's a 50 year old guy who went out there, he tried to drive away from it with the tractor, he tried to get away from this flood and he died. It was the only one I heard so far, you know, that's been a blessing. This is the bad news, people. These people lost everything. But if they have Christ, they haven't lost everything. But can you, but if you don't have Christ, and if your life all depends on what you have, and your bank account, and your possessions, and it's all wiped out like that, what do you got left? And when you got Jesus, you got everything. God, look at Job. Job lost everything. He even lost all his kids. Lost everything. And God restored it all to him, because he had God the whole time. This is why we fast. Now let's go just a bit further. Now Isaiah chapter 7. I want to talk a little bit about. Because uh, Isaiah speaks so clearly about Jesus and his coming. And the times that they wrote about thousands of years ago is where we're living right now. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. <laughs> he said. And then the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So we need to recognize Jesus. You need to recognize Jesus today. It wasn't so terrible yesterday or the day before yesterday in a place called Christ Church, New Zealand. A place called Christ Church, New Zealand. Some nut went into two uh, mosques. It killed 50 people. There are 50 people that are dead, and there's another 50 people that are injured. How awful. 
We're living in a dark world, people. And sadly, I think the spirit of America, because we've, we've, we've been doing these shootings, you don't see a lot of them in other places. We're kind of showing people how to do things over there. They've had their own, I mean, we've seen terrible things in Europe, but New Zealand? This is a peaceful place. But sin is running rapid. The devil's on the loose. And he's going to do anything. And I, I, I thank God, I'm, I better not ever see anybody say, oh, man, the Muslims deserve it. They didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve it. Nobody deserves that. That was a terrible thing that happened. We're living in an evil world. We need some Christian people who really live for Jesus. The problem is, is when you're all caught up in your own self, you need to fast and you need to break yourself so that you can find out what God wants out of you. If this whole thing's about you guys, you're going to miss the whole message of the gospel. Some of you have missed the message of the gospel. You don't know what it's about. It's all about what has Jesus done for me lately. I love him when he's blessing me. When he's not blessing me, I'm mad at him. That's not how this works. you got to love him in the good time, love him in the bad time. It's like your marriage. Right? There's no perfect marriage because you're part of it. It's like there's no perfect churches. You say, I want to go find a perfect church. Once you join it, the church is no longer perfect. You have to have this commitment with the Lord. You have a commitment. See, now, I've told you this before. I've been married to my wife for 34 years. That's what this ring says here. It's not the original ring. I, I broke the first one. I lost another one. We both lost our rings. He breaks her and I break mine. But this is a good one. And this ring here signifies I've been married to Jesus also for those same 34 years. 1985 was a good year for me. I met my Savior and I met my wife. You know, we can't get any better. And I'm going to love them both until I die. And even past when I die. Because I'm living forever. Because my life is not my own. And your life is not your own. And there are people out there that need you to go and touch them with Christ's love. We need to get out of here. But this week, I want you to think about this. I, I, I'm going to try to give you some homework. I'd like you to pray. I'm not even asking you to pray. Just do it because I'm telling you to do it. I want you to take a day this week and I want you to fast your lunch or your dinner. But rather than eating a meal, I would like you to open up your Bible and read in the book of Psalms. By the time that you would sit down and take a lunch, if it's 15 minutes, if it's a half an hour, if it's an hour, instead of eating, I want you to read. Feed your soul. Read, feed your spirit, man. Guys, we've got to get ready, man. This world's getting dark. And if the church isn't going to stand up, I don't know who's going to. The government's not going to help you through this. All hell is about ready to break loose, literally. All hell is about ready to break loose. So pretty soon it's going to be illegal to be a Christian. This is correct. The day will come. They're already trying to make us all look like a bunch of nuts, and then you got some real nuts out there who are making them, you know, winning their case for them. We need people to go out and love people for Jesus' sake. The best thing I love to do is when I'm at work or wherever I'm at, if the Holy Spirit impresses my heart to walk up to somebody and pray for them. He does it a lot. Just out of the blue. They are so shocked that somebody will walk up and say, Can I pray for you? I've never had anyone say, one time, let me take that back. One time, this little guy said, I promise you it's not going to hurt. And she said, okay. But generally, I'll walk up and say, excuse me, can I pray for you every single time? They put their both hands up and let me pray for you. That's what we're called to do, people. But if my mind and my life and my thoughts are all about me, I couldn't care less about them. If your focus is on the Lord, and you just want to be that vessel that God can use, you can hear when he says, hey, Go over, go, go over and pray for that person. There was an old man in my store one day. I've never seen him before. Most of my customers I've seen a lot of. He looked so sad. And it, it broke my heart. It just, I, I don't know. I didn't ask him that day. But he just looked lost. And I think perhaps he just lost his wife. And so that's what my spirit kind of told me. He was just broken. And I said to him, you know the Lord loves you, sir? And he said, well, I hope so. I said, you hope so? You know he died on the cross for you, right? He said, yes. Isn't that amazing? He said, yes, I know he died on the cross for you. I said, he didn't do it because he doesn't like you. And the man stopped, and he smiled. He said, you know, I never thought about it that way before. People, we've really got to spread the news that Jesus loves people. God loves people.
But I'm telling you what, people are tired of hearing about it. They don't want to see it. Amen. It's easy to say, oh, you don't have any food? You want to go Well, God bless you. I'll pray for you. Why don't you do something for them instead? Why don't you give them something to eat or bring them to church or take them to pantry or do whatever you can do? And there are some wonderful people in this congregation. I see acts of kindness. I see Jesus in a lot of your lives very often. And it's a blessing to me to be part of your ministries. But all of you guys have been called by the Lord to do these things. So I'm asking you today, I, I really feel God wants us to take a, a, a look at our lives and to do an inventory, to fast. Instead of eating, or after you eat, uh, then say, Lord, is there any area of my life that doesn't please you? Is there any area of my life that I have put before you? Am I looking to get something out of this for me, or am I looking to be a blessing for you? Am I looking to get glory out of this, or am I looking to give glory to you? Some of you guys, if you be honest, and I've told some of you this before, but a long time ago, I don't remember where I found it or heard it, I don't know if I made it up, but I wrote on a piece of paper one day, on one side of the paper, my daily activities. This is what I did that day. And directly across from each of my activities, I wrote down who got the glory out of that. Who got the glory? So I did this, that, and the other thing, and over here was me, 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 me. Even when you're doing it for the church, sometimes, let's not kid ourselves, sometimes we do things to be seen as people. Sometimes people will come out, hey, Pastor, can I say something? And I don't just give the platform away because if yeah, I have a check in my spirit, the answer's going to be no. Because we don't, we've got plenty of cheerleaders cheering for themselves. We want people who want to glorify Jesus. We have to be people who want to glorify Jesus. This is what God wants out of you. As a Christian, as a born-again Christian, if your life is miserable, I'll be honest with you, it's probably because your life is focused on you. Take your focus off you. Put it on somebody else. And you'll find in the midst when you're hurt, when you're helping someone else, you're ministering to someone else, you'll find your help. Why? Because God created us to do for others. Satan's the one, Satan's the one who put the selfish gene in us. When, he, when, he, when sin came into the camp, we were all born in, with it. But to be like God is to be selfless. To be like the world is to be selfish. The two don't match. They couldn't be any more opposite. So here when he's talking about fasting and, and, and he's saying here what I don't want, I don't want your I don't want your fish Fridays. I'm not interested in you giving up chocolate for three months. Or, I don't care if you, you know, well, I'm not going to drink beer for the whole I'm getting blasted on whiskey, but I ain't drinking beer. <laughs> I've heard that stuff. That pleases God, huh? It just blows me away. Guys, here's, here's, here's where it all lays out. This is all real. God's real. The Bible is real. This is the Word of God. And if you'll follow this word, and if you'll let the Holy Spirit have his way in your life, your life will never be the same again, and you could absolutely be a shining light here on earth. That your light will shine, like it said in the scripture, like the, the dawn into the darkness. Is your light shining today for Jesus, or are you, are you clouding people? Are you covering the light, or are you the light? Jesus said, you're the light of the world. First he said, I'm the light of the world. And he said, you're the light of the world. But sadly, the church in America, we must be one of those uh, black lamps, or what do we used to call those lanterns? Blue lights, dark lights, black lights. Come on, man. Come on, man. Everyone in this room, God created you to know him. God created you to love him. God created you to love people. God created you to help people. God created you to be Jesus. For people. Here, here's how, let me just say this and I'll shut up. Here's how this goes. We were born into sin, every one of us. We're all sinners. That didn't work for God. Because God created man because he wanted to have a one on one relationship with you. God wants a one on one relationship with each one of you. So, 
The only way that could happen was somebody had to pay the, the price for our sin. The Jews and the Hebrews, they were given ways to atone or to cover their sin, but covering your sin does not wash away your sin. What God needed for us to have fellowship with Him is that our sins be completely cleansed, washed away. If I cover something, I haven't cleansed it. If I cleanse it, it's gone. Amen. There's only one who could do that. It's God Himself became a man. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God became a man, born in a manger, born to a virgin. Jesus grew up as a man. He wasn't a spirit. He was a man. He lived 33 years on this earth. He began a ministry at the age of 30 and he, he turned the whole world upside down in three years. The whole world has been changed because of Jesus. You know they used to call it before Jesus was born it was called B.C. You know what that means? Before Christ. Well, I don't know if Jesus really is. Oh, he's God. Come on. Even people who say he's not, they know he is. Then Jesus comes down. He teaches us the way to the Father. He shows us the Father's character, his personality, and then he becomes the Lamb of God. And this perfect, sinless, spotless man 